Hi, I'm Ken Riley, pastor of Hewitt Community Church. I want to thank you for joining with us today. If you're inspired by what you see or by what you hear, or you'd like to know more about Hewitt Community Church, then please visit our website at hewittcc.org. All right, so we're getting into the Word today. We are continuing in our series, A Life Well Lived. It is through this series, of course, that we are studying the book of Ecclesiastes. The premise or the motivation behind this series is exactly what the title says. We are looking at what the Scriptures have to say concerning living life well. It is God's desire, it is God's delight that you live this life well. And so we are looking at the advice that His Word gives us on how to do that uh, today. Uh, we're going to be in Ecclesiastes 9. Actually, we're going to be picking up where we left off in Ecclesiastes 9. Uh, I'm going to start in Ecclesiastes 9, uh, beginning with verse 2. We, we began last week, but let's look at this by beginning with verse 2. Ecclesiastes 9, 2. Uh, Solomon writes this. He says, all share a common destiny. All share a common destiny. The word all means all. So there's nobody here that's excluded from this. We all share a common destiny, the righteous and the wicked, the good and the bad, the clean and the unclean, those who offer sacrifices and those who do not. I think that covers just about everybody. And he goes on to say the same destiny overtakes all. Okay, so the word destiny there, it means fate or appointment. And so Solomon is teaching that whether you're a good person or whether you're a bad person, whether you're a believer or an unbeliever, we all share the same fate. We all have the same appointment to keep. And I think that you probably already know what fate or what appointment that Solomon is referring to. The Bible says it is appointed unto man once to die. And so Solomon is teaching us that while some people may die young, other people may die in their old age, while some people might, might die suddenly, while other people die slowly, while for some people their death might be front page news, while for other people their death will barely be noticed, nevertheless, it's still the same conclusion for everyone. Everyone dies. All right. So having understood this foundation, what is Solomon's point? Well, let's continue reading. Ecclesiastes 9.4, he says this, Anyone who is among the living has hope. Even a live dog is better off than a dead lion. Let me read that again. Anyone who is among the living has hope. Even a live dog is better than a dead lion. Okay, here is where Solomon's wisdom really shines through. If you have not been impressed with Solomon's wisdom, you will be impressed here. Because here is where the supernatural manifestation of his wisdom and knowledge really comes to light. Do you know what he's saying here? Do you know what he's saying here? Get ready. He's saying this. It is better to be alive than to be dead. It is better to be alive than to be dead. Now, I know you're, you're probably thinking, you're thinking, Pastor, I am so glad that you shared this truth from God's Word for me today. Of course I knew that it was better to be alive. You mean I got up and got ready for church this morning and that's all you got? That's all you've got to tell me is something that I already knew. It's better to be alive than to be dead. Pastor, I already knew that it was better to be alive than to be dead. But my question to you is this. Are you sure that you know? Are you sure that you know that it's better to be alive than to be dead? See, a 2005 survey revealed that 54% of Americans are bored with their lives. 70% of students are bored with school. 22% of husbands and 14% of wives are bored with their marriages. 
the Center for Media Education has said that an average school child spends about 1,500 hours per year in front of the TV. That's as compared to about 900 hours per year that they would spend in the classroom. The Center for Media Education goes on to say that at that rate, that child by age 21 will have seen one million commercials. <laughs> and that by age 70, that person will have spent approximately 10 years of their life sitting in front of the TV. Now, now what's the point? The point is, if life is better than death, and you already know that life is better than death, then why are you wasting yours? Now, don't misunderstand me. This is not a sermon against TV. I myself like TV. But the point is, if you already know that you're going to die, then doesn't it make sense to make the most of the life that you've got. See, over the course of the last couple of Sundays, Solomon has emphasized that a well-lived life depends on trusting and obeying God, uh, staying poised in obedience to his word, but also trusting in his sovereignty and in his timing. And here, in keeping with that theme of living a well-lived life through obedience and trust in God's word, Solomon now gives three additional pointers. Let's look at them together. Number one, he says, take initiative in the things that you can control. Take initiative in the things you can control. Let's continue reading Ecclesiastes 9, 7, where he writes, Go, eat your food with gladness. Can you say amen to that? See, going out to eat after church is scriptural. You have to obey it as a command. Go, eat your food with gladness and drink your wine with a joyful heart. For God has already approved what you do. For God has already approved what you do. Now, that phrase, God has already approved what you do. It means that in your life, there are certain things that God has placed to your discretion. Um, it would kind of like me, uh, be me, uh, giving each of my grandchildren a hundred dollar bill and then letting them decide for themselves how they're going to use it. Well, that's what Ecclesiastes 9, 7 is saying. It is teaching us that there are certain gifts that God has given to you. He was not obligated to give you these gifts. He was delighted to give you these gifts. He's given you these gifts because he loves you. But now that he has given them to you, he has left it up to your discretion as to how that you're going to use them. Okay, well, what are some of the gifts that he's given us? Well, one gift he's given us is the gift of thanksgiving. The gift of thanksgiving. Let's continue reading Ecclesiastes 9.8. He says, always be clothed in white and always anoint your head with oil. Uh, white clothes, anointed heads in the Bible, uh, those were symbolic of celebration and joyful living. And so Solomon was teaching that God approves of his people enjoying their lives. He approves of his people having fun. He enjoys, he approves of his people getting enjoyment out of life. And, and you know, I think that that's really important because there are some Christians who equate e enjoying life with sin. They, they seem to be of the opinion that if you're having fun in any capacity, then you must be doing something wrong. I've shared before that growing up, we had a pastor who would, who would preach from the pulpit that it was a sin to go to ball games. Well, why would anybody in their right mind think that loving Jesus means that you can't attend sporting events? Well, I think it stems from the fact that 
they have fallen for this notion that, that holiness is affiliated with misery. That, you know, loving God means that you can't enjoy anything that this world has to offer. Uh, they've not yet understood that obedience to God is not meant to alienate you from the delights of life. It is meant to enhance the delights of life. Uh, look with me at 1 Timothy 6.17. 1 Timothy 6.17, uh, Paul writes, he says, As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. Set your hopes on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. Uh, that expression uh, is an expression of expectation. And so what Paul is, is, is teaching uh, Timothy here, and therefore teaching the church, is that God richly provides you with a steady stream of things to enjoy. Did you know that? that that's, in, that's what's being implied here. That, uh, let's see, uh, that richly provides, uh, that could also be in, translated as steadily. So we're talking about this ongoing, uh, if you want to envision like a stream or a brook or, or, or some running water. Well, that's the idea here. God provides this steady stream of things for you to enjoy. However, he has left it up to you to notice them through your thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is the means that he has given you to notice the steady stream of delights that he has put into your life. Let me give you a little example of what I'm talking about. Uh, on Monday, I got to go to Graham's baseball game. And I got to watch him play ball. That was a delight that the Lord put in my day. Uh, on Tuesday, uh, I, I was reminded on Tuesday that it has been 10 years. Tuesday was my son-in-law's 10-year anniversary when he had major surgery, almost died. And yet in those 10 years, the Lord has raised him up uh, to, to look at him today. You would not know that he's ever been sick a day in his life. I praise God for that. That was a delight that God put in my path on Tuesday. On Wednesday, well, you already know what my delight was. I got to meet with you. I got to be, well, with some of you. Uh, <laughs> we, we got to spend some time in God's Word, and I got to spend some time with God's people. That was the delight that the Lord put in, in my path. Then on Thursday, on Thursday, I got a double blessing. Uh, I got to go see uh, Georgia Claire cheerlead. She's a cheerleader in kindergarten. Go, black, go, gold. She was awesome. She was fantastic. She was better than all the others. <laughs> so I got to go see her. And then later that same day, I got to see Graham play his final baseball game. His team was undefeated. They were first place. What a delight. What a delight that God put in my path. And then on Friday, Friday, I got to, that's my day off. I got to spend it with my wife. What is the point? The point is that the Bible says that God, because he loves you, not because he's obligated to you, he puts this steady stream of delights and gifts in your day. But it is only through thanksgiving and attitude of expectation and praise that you notice the things that he has put before you. This brings me to another gift that God gives us, and that's the gift of relationships. Let's continue reading Ecclesiastes 9.9, 9, where he writes, Enjoy life with your wife, whom you love, all the days of this meaningless life that God has given you under the sun. All your meaningless days, for this is your lot in life, 
and in your toilsome labor under the sun. In other words, he's saying, you know what, husbands, you need to enjoy your wives. Wives, you need to enjoy your husbands. Children, you need to enjoy your parents. Parents, you need to enjoy your children. I, I can remember years ago in our church in Temple, there was a couple, and, and they um, were... I guess they were about to retire. They had been married a number of years. And they took a trip to Europe. And I don't know if they traveled a lot, but they took this trip to Europe. And I remember uh, that this particular gentleman, uh, to surprise his wife, he extended their vacation one extra day. They got to spend it in Paris, France. And they ended that day by spending the night in a five-star luxury hotel. Surprised is what he did good. <laughs> Do you know that just weeks after returning from that trip, his wife suddenly passed away? And as sad as it was for him to lose his wife, you know, she left this earth not only seeing the Eiffel Tower, but she left this earth knowing that she was loved. And she was valued. And as sad as that was, I couldn't help but thinking, what a great job he did. In showing his wife, he took the time to enjoy what God had given him in his spouse. There's a lot of spouses that leave this earth and they never know that. There's a lot of spouses who they, they lose their significant other. And with that loss, they forever lose the chance to let that spouse know how much they are meant. And so God has given us the gift of family and, and relationships. Listen, I, I know that we're coming up on the holidays and, you know, we're going to meet with the crazy aunt or the, you know, the, the, the cousin that's, you know, just gotten out of prison, you know, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and, and so I know that, that sometimes families can be a lot of work. But let me encourage you, in the same way that you work to get along with your family, Work to enjoy your family. There, there is some joy. There are some gifts of God that is found there within those family relationships. This brings me to a third gift that God has given us, and that's the gift of work. You say, work? Yes. The gift of work. Let's continue reading Ecclesiastes 9.10. He says, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all of your might. For in the realm of the dead where you are going, there is neither working nor planning nor knowledge nor wisdom. In other words, from the beginning, God created you to envision, to plan, and to do. That's why work can be enjoyable. Uh, let me take you back to Genesis 1.28. I, I think I often refer to this, but this is so, uh, so applicable here. In Genesis 1.28, God gives... This mandate to mankind. Let's look at it. He says, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky. Over every living creature that moves on the ground. Notice the directives. Number one, he says to man, I want you to be fruitful. God has placed an expectation upon you to leave this world in better condition than you found it. Number two, he says, subdue. God wants you to go out and conquer life. He wants you to expand your borders. He wants you to accept and to win the challenges that are placed before you. He wants you to take risk. He wants you to explore. He wants you to discover. He wants your life to be interesting. And then finally, he says, rule. God wants you to be responsible over the things in your care. He wants you to be a good steward over the things that you have been given. Uh, Paul mirrors that in Colossians 2.23, uh, where he says, Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. You know, I'm going to go out on a limb here and, and say that Everything you have, as well as everything that you are, you're obligated to please the Lord with it. That's the reason why I believe, I believe, so you can take this or leave it, I believe a Christian is somebody whose home 
doesn't look like it's been vacant for six months. The, the yard is cut. The flower bed is weeded. The house is in good repair. I'm not saying it has to look like it's on the cover of Better Homes and Gardens, but it de- does need to look decent. It's one of the ways that you give honor to the Lord. That house is a gift God has given you. Same thing goes with your car. You know, your car should not smell like a dog died in it. (laughs) Your car should be clean. Your car should be in good running order for the same reason. Uh, Same reason why you need to take care of your body. You need to exercise. Yeah, you need to push away from the table for exactly the same reason. The Bible says that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Uh, God gave you that body as a gift. He did not owe it to you. I mean, you do know, don't you, that God was not obligated to give you a church with air conditioning and running water. He gave you a church with air conditioning and running water because he was delighted to do so, not because he was obligated to do so. He's given you these things because he loves you. It was his good will to give you these things, but now you have a responsibility to enjoy them and to take delight in them by being a good steward over them. Can I hear an amen? Amen. And if I might even meddle just a little bit more, you know, the Bible implies to us that we should be the best workers in the marketplace. You know, Acts 2.47 says that the early Christians enjoyed the favor of all the people. I think one of the reasons for that is because within that community, uh, the Christians were the best employees. They were the best employers. They were the best neighbors. They were the best citizens. You know, I can remember when I was in youth ministry. And uh, my young people, they would want to raise money for some kind of cause. And I don't remember what the cause was, but they wanted to do a car wash. And I, okay, we'll do a car wash. But I said, I, I said to them, and, and Caleb was in my youth group at that time, so he knows what I'm going to say. I'd say, if we're going to wash cars... We're going to give Jeannie a run for their money. Because if we're going to wash cars, we're going to wash cars better than anybody else in town. Why? Because we are not just representing our youth group. We are not just representing the church. We are representing the Lord Jesus Christ through that endeavor. And so one of the ways that you enjoy your life is through your work, the work that God has given you. Okay, so so that brings me to the second pointer that Solomon has for enthusiastic living. Uh, First, he said, uh, take initiative to change the things that you can change. Take initiative on the things that are within your realm of control. But then this number two, it's this, it's okay that you can't control everything. It's okay that you can't control everything. Ecclesiastes 9.11. He said, I have seen something else under the sun. The race is not to the swift or the battle to the strong, nor does food come to the wise or wealth to the brilliant or favor to the learned, but time and chance happened to them all. Time and chance happened to them all. What is Solomon saying? Well, he's saying something he's fundamentally already said, and that's this. Life is predictable. Life is unpredictable. Excuse me. Life is unpredictable. Um, Having natural abilities, having a good work ethic, does not automatically guarantee success. Having plans, making plans is fine, but plans don't often work out the way that you thought. Uh, Bo Jackson was the Heisman Trophy winner in 1985. Uh, He was the first athlete to be named as an all-star in two major sports, football and baseball. Uh, He could run the 40-yard dash in 4.12 seconds. That is an unofficial record that he still holds. Nobody has ever been able to beat that. He was supposed to go to places, and yet in January of 1991, a hip injury ended his athletic career at the ripe old age of 29 years old. What is the point? 
The point is, at any given time, God can interrupt your plans. And isn't it just like God to, incon- to interrupt your plans at the most inconvenient time? But just to clarify, again, there's nothing wrong with making plans. Uh, but the point is, don't love and trust your plans more than you love and you trust God. You know, the Bible is full of people who had all kinds of potential and had made all kinds of plans. The biggest, brawniest guy in the Bible was a guy named Goliath. And Goliath thought he was going places, and yet he was struck down by a little shepherd boy with one single stone. The best-looking guy in the Bible was a guy named Absalom. Picture this. The Bible says that Absalom didn't have a flaw on him from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. That was somebody that was going places. And yet the Bible tells us that he died at a very young age by hanging in a tree. What is the point? The point is trust and obey God with your plans. Obey God in the things you know to do. Include God in the plans that you make. Include God in your priorities. Include God in your day. Obey Him, but also trust Him for the things you can't control. Because in obeying Him in the things you know to do and in trusting Him for the things that you don't know, in trusting Him for the things that you can't control, that's where you find enjoyment. And then finally, number three, Solomon's third piece of advice for enthusiastic living He says this, substance is more important than image. Substance is more important than image. Look at this story that Solomon is about to tell us. Ecclesiastes 9, beginning with verse 13. He said, I also saw under the sun this example of wisdom that greatly impressed me. There was once a small city with only a few people in it, and a powerful king came against it, surrounded it, and built Uh, huge siege works against it. Now, there lived in that city a man poor but wise, and he saved the city by his wisdom. But nobody remembered that poor man. And so I said, wisdom is better than strength, but the poor man's wisdom is despised, and his words are no longer heeded. Okay, so as you can tell, Solomon is telling this story about a a poor but wise man who shrewdly and apparently single-handedly saved his city or his community from disaster. And while I'm sure his neighbors at the time were very, very grateful, the point that Solomon is making here is that nobody bothered to memorialize this man or to memorialize what it is that he had done. Nobody ever uh, took the time to, to mention him in the history books. Nobody ever took the time to erect a statue in his honor. Uh, two or three generations later, uh, he has been completely forgotten. Well, what's the point of this story? Well, fundamentally speaking, it's twofold. Number one, it's always better to be wise than to be rich. It's always better to be wise than to be rich. But just because you are wise, don't think people will care. And don't think people will notice. You may say, Pastor, what does this have to do with with enjoying life or enjoying God? Well, keep in mind that committing yourself to be a student of God's Word is always smart. Can I hear an amen on that? Committing yourself... To be a student of God's Word, not just in understanding what it says, but doing what it says, that is always going to be a smart thing for you to do, without doubt. Young people, did you hear that? It is always smart to consider and to put into action the instruction and the advice of God's Word. You can never go wrong with that. However... You need to keep in mind that while some people might admire you and even from time to time they might even ask you for advice, they're not going to remember you. See, in in Luke 18, Jesus told the story of a tax collector 
who, who goes into uh, the temple. He is repentant, and you know the story. He says, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. And the story says that that man left the temple. He left the Lord's presence, justified before God, but not before anybody else. His repentant heart didn't get him one bit of recognition, of recognition with men. And in today's world, at the pace in which we're living, it could very well be that no one will ever notice or appreciate your efforts to live for God. It's not necessarily fair, but that's the way that it is. And that is why, unless you have a relationship with, with Christ, you're never going to make sense with this world. I remember, remember Asaph. We talked about Asaph, I think, last Sunday or a couple of Sundays ago. Uh, in Psalm 73, 2 and 3, he said this, But as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I, I nearly lost my foothold, for I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. In other words, if you're like Asaph, if you evaluate this world and, and your faith in God based on the here and now, you're always going to be frustrated. You're always going to be confused. You're always going to be conf uh, depressed. But when you keep your eyes on Christ, when you stay poised in obeying and trusting him, despite what you see around you, despite the response of those around you, you're always going to get more than what meets the eye. See, if you go back to Psalm 73 and you continue reading what Asaph says, he says at the beginning, he says, I got to confess, Lord, I, I, I was looking at everything that was going on around me and I nearly lost my faith. I was thinking about throwing in the towel. But look what happens to Asaph as he makes this confession. He says in verse 25, he says, Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth is nothing that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Those who are far from you will perish. You will destroy all who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge, and I will tell of all your deeds. In other words, even when nobody may be applauding your wisdom to follow Christ right now, when all is said and done, God's gift of wisdom will ultimately be what carries you through the inequities of life. In other words, if you're going to get the enjoyment out of this life that God wants you to have, you cannot do it outside of of a relationship with Jesus Christ. Revere God, learn His Word, trust Him, obey Him, work hard, strive to be holy, do it when nobody else notices. As Christians, we hold all these things, we hold that all these things are true, but at the very beginning of all of it, at the very beginning, there must be a relationship with God which is only made possible through his son, Jesus Christ. Today is Communion Sunday. Here at Hewitt Community Church, we practice an open communion. By an open communion, I mean to say that we do not limit communion only to our church members. If you are here among us, you are a guest, even if you are a first-time guest. We are delighted that you are here and we welcome you and invite you to participate within the communion celebration. However, we must make one requirement. And that requirement is that you must have a relationship with God only made possible through His Son, Jesus Christ. And that's the reason why almost every Sunday here at Hewitt Community Church, we end our gathering with Romans 10.9 which says this, If you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. 
Why are these two stipulations necessary for salvation? Well, number one, declaring that Jesus Christ is Lord is synonymous with agreement. By declaring that Jesus Christ is Lord, you are also agreeing that Jesus Christ is Lord. In other words, you are agreeing with everything that the Bible says about who Jesus Christ is. You are agreeing with everything that the Bible says about who God is. But most importantly, in this context, you are agreeing with everything that the Bible says about who you are. And the Bible says in Jeremiah 17 that our hearts are deceitful, that even we are not aware of the depths of sin that our hearts are capable of sinking. The Bible does not say that to make you feel bad about yourself. The Bible simply says that so that you will understand your awareness will be raised to your need for a Savior. And therefore, for salvation to occur... You must agree with what the Bible says about who you are, that you are a sinner and that you are in need of a Savior. And thankfully, that Savior is provided through none other than Jesus Christ, who you make Lord. And then secondly, Romans 10, 9 says that we must believe that God raised Christ from the dead. What does that really mean? Well, it means that in the same way that Jesus Christ always followed the leading of the Holy Spirit. He was always submissive to the will of his Father. He never did anything outside of the will of God. That's what believing Jesus Christ was raised from the dead means. It means that when you are saved, that you take on the Spirit of Christ, and from that day forward... You are committing yourself to be humble and to be submissive so that you might follow in the footpath of Christ. That is namely that you might follow in submitting to the will of the Father in everything that you do and everything that you say. You say, Pastor, how in the world can I even begin to do that? By becoming a student of God's word. It goes back full circle, in other words, by making Jesus Christ Lord. And so before we go any further in this gathering, I, I want to lead you in this prayer. I want to say there is no magic in the words. Don't concentrate so much on the words as much as I am inviting you to use this opportunity to ensure that your relationship with God has, is intact, that it has been secured through the person of Jesus Christ. And so as I lead you in this prayer, what I would ask you to do is simply to embrace the spirit and the heart of this prayer. So would you pray this after me? Heavenly Father, I believe that your word is true. I believe that Jesus Christ is your son, is your son. I believe that he lived a perfect life and that he died on the cross so that I may have forgiveness of sin, so that I might have abundant life, and so I might have eternal life. And so I now confess with my mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. I believe in my heart that you raised him from the dead. I ask you to forgive me of my sin, to give me a new heart. I ask you to take control of my life. I ask you to point me in the direction that you'd have me go. Thank you for doing this. And Lord, if I might stop right here and just say that we are so thankful for your gifts. We are so thankful for that, that vision of this steady stream of gifts that flow from the foot of the cross into the hearts, into the lives of your people. And I would pray that as we prepare to take this communion, that we would do so with a heart of thanksgiving, gratitude for what you have done, 
but also with a heart of expectation, looking forward to what it is that you are going to do. We love you so much, Lord. Thanks again for watching. Again, if you'd like to know more about Hewitt Community Church, then please visit our website at hewittcc.org. And don't forget, if you have been blessed in any capacity by the Lord or by His Word, then you are automatically obligated to be a blessing to others.